Hi, folks. This is Ken Ween on It Matters Radio. Unfortunately, my co-host, Monica Brinkman, is not with us today, which is a real shame because I know how much she loves our guest, Melissa Price. And we're going to be talking to Melissa in a minute, but I do have an extra guest with us today. Uh, you folks may remember him because he has been on other It Matters Radio. Yes, it's Thackeray. Hello. Hi, folks. Thackeray. Now, Thackeray is a, not a big reader because he tends to like bedtime stories and falls asleep a lot. But he had a question for you about your novel, Smile Number Seven. So here is his. Fire away, Thackeray. His here is his question. He really enjoyed the book as much of it as he was able to stay awake watching a reading with me, but he was a little concerned because one of your principal characters, who was a movie star no less, and so he really identifies with her, uh, had an addiction to chocolate. And he wanted your help because he's concerned that he has an addiction too. To sleeping. I totally get it. To sleeping. So he wants to know how he can tell if he has a sleep abuse problem. Hmm. Well, in my defense, I have to say that I'm a pan chocolatist. I don't discriminate between chocolates. So the best I can tell him is if he's eating too much chocolate, he may feel too good. He can relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, folks, I wanted to start off with that, and Thackeray was willing to help me because I want you to know this book, Smile Number Seven, is a book that made me smile. It made me laugh. And it made Thackeray laugh, too. That was, just a, it, that was the intention. Um, can, I, can I address that a little bit? Please, Pam? please. Okay. Well, I had uh, originally, Smile Number 7 was written as a short story for an anthology. And it was from uh, the younger character's point of view. And it was, you know, a very shallow overview of these two people. And it, it really had so many markings of what should be a novel. Because there was so much more to explore that the short story really didn't do it justice. And so when I sat down to conceive the novel, it was around the 2016 election. It was after that. And, you know, my books prior to this were lesbianage. They were romantic intrigue. And so there's always that, that intense pacing and storyline that isn't always bright and cheery because of the subject matter. And what I realized personally after the 2016 election was that there was this heaviness that was pervasive and I, I felt it too. And so in designing this novel, I chose to create a story that would be happy, that would be uplifting, that would entertain. Because more than anything, I wanted to show up as a writer every day for the next year to something that brought feelings of love and happiness and goodness. And it brought things and people together. So that was the impetus for writing Smile. So I'm glad it made you laugh and it made you smile. Mm -hmm. Now we have to, you brought in your second character in this wonderful love story. I mean, there's lots of other things to the plot. And in fact, uh, 
it's only on, well, this actress goes for rehab for her chocolate addiction, and then she goes, continues, she's in California, she continues eastward to Scottsdale, Arizona, where she goes to a spa to kind of recuperate from her rehab, as it were. And then on the way back, she meets the love interest, who is a wonderfully joyous character, a woman who runs a little diner uh, and raise, has a couple horses, lives on the family ranch, which, you know, here in Arizona, you go, you head west from Phoenix area and you get to the middle of nowhere, kind of. So there are lots of little towns in, in Arizona, then you get across the border, the river, and you get into California, there are more in little towns. <clears throat> and she lives in one of these. <clears throat> and she has this lovely ranch that's, by the way, I, I think you portray the horseback riding and the scenery and, and the feel of the diner and all of that wonderfully. Uh, Thank you. And, you know, the only, I have one problem though. I have to tell you, I do have one problem with this, um, that having driven that stretch between, you know, heading out of Phoenix and going out Route 10, uh, I've never found that diner. And I want to, you're going to have to send me the directions because boy, the food sounds a lot better than what I usually end up getting along the way. But I hear you. I hear you. But anyway, so she meets this wonderful character and the, the center of this story is around this romance and, and the things that get in the way and the people who get in the way. And, and I don't want to do too many spoilers here, folks. Um, well, it's not a spoiler to say that the biggest obstacle and person in the, that obstacle is the main character herself. Yes, yes. It is a, a, you have a real character arc here. Your characters grow. You know, this is not trivial kind of literature. This is Thank you. real. This is a real novel, folks, with a real characters who change and grow and learn. Uh, but, you know, I, I thought, I was wondering when I read it, because of course I've read other of your stuff, and as you pointed out, you changed direction of your writing. This is a very different book than the books that went before it. And you're, you're a publisher, Bella Books, which is a wonderful publishing house. How did they, Truly. Re how did they react? So you are coming with this totally new piece of work. They were terrific. You know, it, I think it may have surprised them a little bit when I had originally submitted Smile because of the very reason you say. You know, I, I love intrigue and where it intersects with romance. But the comment I remember getting when they accepted it for publication was that they really enjoyed reading this one. And mm -hmm. so, you know, if you know the background of Bella Books, even though they publish a, a really wide range of stories, um, their heritage, so to speak, their ancestry is in romance publishing. Right. And so I think what Smile did was it, it, it was really more in line with the original uh, Bella Books, whose ancestor was Nyad Press. And as the largest and maybe only lesbian publisher way back when, they published a lot of romance. I remember mis reading Mysteries also. But, you know, then they expanded right. as writing expanded and time went by. And I think they were happy to see a straight up romance from me. Mm -hmm. I know I was because for me as a writer, um, you know, sadly, there are so, and, and it's all across the board, whether you're talking about um, genres, subgenres, authors, 
a lot of authors who are very talented and great writers, they find their niche mm -hmm. and they pretty much follow it endlessly. It. Yeah, they keep, it. definitely. They keep redeveloping it. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that because, you know, readers read a particular author oftentimes because they can depend that on, on that author to continue along that vein. I'm a little bit outside the box in that. Um, why should that be any different from the rest of me? But, <laughs> you know, going from lesbianage into pure romance was a delight. It was a discovery. And um, now... The book that I just submitted yesterday is a socio-political farce. So, you know, I think I'm always pushing the envelope to reach the best story. You're going to have to promise me that when your new book's ready, you're going to send me a copy and we're going to do another interview about it. Absolutely. But knowing your editor prowess, I am... I am probably not going to send you the manuscript I submitted. Okay. <laughs> you, I, you I do have, tend to find these you, little picky things that I bother Melissa with. <laughs> that's okay. Oh, it's all good. But this was a really tough book to write. And it was sparked by the insanity uh, that we've been going through socially and politically. But I wanted to write a story. Uh, you know, there's so much negativity happening in our world right now. And this particular story titled The Right Closet, I didn't want to make a negative view of such vitriol that is happening in our country. Yeah. So I choose to see it as a positive story about the negative things that have come into our world. And I've chosen to resolve it and plot it in a way where such adversarial people in the end find their humanity and through that find the love and the connection to make a better world. Um, well, I, I don't want to go too far with that book. I, I'm waiting. I'm going to read it. I'm looking forward to reading it. Thackeray says he's looking forward to reading it. But what I don't want to do is use up our time talking about that and not stay with Smile. But before we do, you know, you mentioned before your diversity as a writer, but also as a person. So, folks, I just want to draw your attention to the background of this picture. You, you see diplomas and Melissa is a doctor of chiropractic and you will see a guitar and she is a great guitarist and sometimes <coughs> includes the guitar in her writing and she also, what you cannot see but I know, is deep down inside of her she is also Jamaican and so yeah, she, yeah. yeah so you got to understand there's all this wonderful diversity that she pulls in as she's writing, which I, I think makes some of the richness. And I did want to draw attention to the fact that, you know, you are more than two, ten fingers connected to a keyboard. Ah, that's how it's done. Thank you. <laughs> uh, now, I wanted to talk for a minute. Be about you, the title of this book, Smile Number Seven, because this is a running joke, and yet at another level, not a joke. It's a serious joke that runs through the book about expressions and how people use them. <laughs> Thank you. What was that one? That was like <laughs> discuss number four, wasn't it? <laughs> it's so true. Would you like but, to talk? you know, seriously, if you had to describe what someone is feeling by the smile that they use, 
um, that's that was some of the most challenging aspect of writing this because the character has achieved world fame by being able to capture that and um yeah it 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 really was a challenge to close my eyes i'm a very visual writer mm -hmm. and i do not write a scene a character or a dialogue without seeing it as if that person or those people were in the room in a live action video and so that's where I put it on pause and I say, great, right now, describe exactly what you're seeing. And um, that's where the smiles in smile number seven came from, mm -hmm. as well as the other expressions. Yeah. And the nice thing is that because you are telling us a number, it makes the reader able to imagine it without your having to somehow try and describe every movement and twitch of muscle. And yet you, it's very clear that we're talking about something very practice, uh, kind of practiced by the carrier and then maybe not so practiced. And that's one of the ways that we see the character arc develop because in fact, as she goes along and as the relationship deepens and enriches, the, there's more sincerity in what she does. And well, you know, in ca you know, as a great writer, and you are, um, that so much of character development, it, you know, you have tools you use. You use narrative or description or dialogue, but so much of what happens in Smile, it's not just naming the expression and describing it, it's making sure that in any given scene or interaction that you have built the scene or that moment solidly enough so that when you do describe that smile, it just seals that moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. And it really is, it's a very powerful tool that you've come up with. And I commend you for it. I, I think it's, I have a feeling that as other people read Smile Number 7 by you, Melissa Price, published by Bella Books. Notice how I'm getting the, the whole plug in here, folks. Uh, as people do it, they read it, they are going to be start realizing that this is a way that you can describe things without tormenting yourself as a writer or your reader to just hack into this method really very 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 smart method that um, thank Melissa's you developed yeah now I, I want you know I, I think that the characters around your two principal characters are fascinating because they really come from two totally different worlds in the one world, you have the flax of the Hollywood star and, you know, all her protective people, you know, her agent and her publicity person and her, you know, gopher. And on the other, you have this person who running a diner who has the people who work at the diner and who uh, her sister, she has a, happens to have an identical twin sister who lives in New York and her mother from whom she is estranged. But these are all much more um, down to earth, if you will, people. People who are, are very real. And then you have a character that kind of bridges them in a very strange way. And I wanted to talk about Swan. Ah, uh, Swan. Because you know what? Yes. When I was reading the book, Melissa, I have to tell you, of all the characters in the book, the one that I saw as most like you was Swan. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, I have to do my shrink thing, right? Oh, I I'm in, man. <laughs> Analyze away. <laughs> so why don't, why don't you talk a little about Swan? Because I think she's a wonderful bridge character to take the make it possible 
for these two worlds in some way to to co coexist? Well, in creating Swan, my goal was to create a a perfectly flawed character who was in touch with everyday life, who was living in that upscale world of the film business. And it was, for me, the perfect way to have someone almost act as Katerina Veralta, the actress's uh, alter ego at different moments. Katerina removes herself from her very big and impressive life to go into a space where she's finally ready to, to confront herself. Why is she unhappy? What is, what's not working for her? She's got everything a human being could possibly want in terms of success, in terms of her lifestyle. You know, all the things that regular people like me idealize. But how ideal is it when you pull back that curtain? And I wanted a place for Katerina to explore who she really is. And to do that, I needed to have someone there who, while impressed with who she was professionally, didn't have a problem relating to another human being who was also struggling. And sometimes my feeling is when you get two people who are struggling, even if their struggles are different, but they can bond, they can create a, a third entity called a safe space. And um, I wasn't sure how far the Swan character would carry through the novel, but as I continued writing and what wound up happening toward the end of the book, the impetus for the shift, in Katerina's life, one would think it would come from her not being able to deal with her own demons. Well, yeah, that's true. But even if she saw those, what would she do with them? Mm -hmm. She needed a way to navigate to her better self, her higher self, her greater being. And Swan provided that safe space because within the context of a rehab, there's a trust between people that it's safe. No, nothing's going to leave those walls. The bonds you create, the things you say, the, the emotions you allow are going to be entrusted to people who will respect them and you. And mm -hmm. so that's where Swan came in. Okay. And as I say, I, I saw in Swan a great deal of you. Or a great deal of you and Swan, which one way or the other. <laughs> uh, I have to just, before we run out of time, and we are running short here, I do have to mention the two horses. Because I, I love animals. And I think that one of the most wonderful things that bonds people on this earth is their connection to animals. I agree. You know, uh, vec animal pets or horses can be vectors for love. They can be vectors for aggression. They can be vectors for all kinds of interpersonal connection. And I thought that what was fascinating is you have the two horses living at the at the ranch thunder and lightning which again the very the lightness the, you know okay give them kind of funny light names um and these two horses are both the symbol of this incredible bond between two twin identical twin sisters and between a woman katharina and her lover and I love the symbolism that you gave these two horses. Well, you know, no secret that I'm 
I'm yeah, a doggy in a human body to begin with. But a lot of things work in pairs in, in that story. The two horses, the bond between the two sisters, their individual bonds with those horses. And now this singular individual who everyone in Katerina Veralta's life throughout the book laughs at the thought of her being in a barn. And yet that's where she finds her true self. And so that bond now brings her in, not just to Julia, but to Julia's bond with the horses, where she gets to create something bigger than, than human bonds. And with that... And, you know, choosing the names, choosing the names Thunder and Lightning were basically meant to represent uh, Julia's childhood. You know, it, it's made clear that she's had these horses for a long time, time yes. and that she and that she grew up on a horse, you know, riding practically since she could walk. And so those names are kind of an endearment, something that a child might name her horses. Yes. Yeah. I didn't think the names were I thought the names were light and delightful, but not inappropriate because they did go back to the childhood. So, and also the metaphorical pairing of lightning and thunder. Yeah. It was another pairing in the book. Yeah, and also it alluded, as long as we're talking about it, to the to the Stromandrang of Julia's childhood, which was a very difficult one. But I'm going to leave that part for the readers because I have to tell you, folks. Okay, and. Thackeray will agree wholeheartedly. He's been sleeping over here, but he wanted to come back on for this. Uh, he says, Look Thackeray, for it. this one's for you. Yeah. Smile number seven by our guest today, Melissa Price. And it's published by Bella Books. And you can get it, obviously, in paperback, uh, as Melissa just showed you, or electronic, uh, if you are a Kindle reader or Nook reader. And it's just a great, fun read that also has a lot of emotion and feeling. And yes, I know. It makes, you may it makes for close, bonding. You may, you may want to close Thackeray's ears for this, but I will admit, I will admit that about every 10 or 15,000 words, I had the urge to blow something up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Melissa, I've known you long enough to not be surprised by that. <laughs> hey, you know, one, once an intrigue author, always an intrigue author. But to be fair, you know, there isn't a romance worth its weight that's been written that didn't at least blow up a relationship. So I got go. my fill. <laughs> Folks, thank you so much for joining us today. Melissa Price, thank you for joining us on It Matters Radio.